And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk on this Monday, November 22nd. Great to have you here with us once again. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Thank you for joining us here. MarketTalkAg.com. That's our home on the web. MarketTalkAg.com is where you can find us. All of our social media links, streaming sources, and much more. It is all there. MarketTalkAg.com. We'll be coming to a holiday shortened week with a lot of bullish momentum in the grain markets, and that uh, carried over to livestock as well. We saw some strength in that market, too. A lot to discuss. Let's bring in our good friend John Heimberg with Total Farm Marketing here joining us for this Monday. John, good afternoon, and uh, back to uh, video screens for you and me after I saw you in Kansas City last week. Yeah, it was great seeing everybody in person, but you know, back to what we've been doing here for uh, a little while, so... Um, but yeah, it's good trip last week down to KC. Saw a lot of good people, and uh, mm-hmm. and like I said, enjoyed the chance to finally be out and meet some people in person again. Definitely, it was it was great to catch up with everyone. And uh, I, I know we kind of alluded to you know typically seeing a choppy holiday week trade when you and I were talking last week in person. Uh, uh, nothing really choppy about today's trade. Came in here a lot of bullish momentum uh, in these uh, grain markets, particularly wheat and. I think with this wheat market, we know the story. The story hasn't changed. It's just a matter of maybe a, a few news items being thrown at this wheat market today. I, I'm curious your thoughts on on what you saw with the strength in wheat here on Monday. Well, we got a little bit, few different headlines that are kind of popping into the market overall. But again, strong double digit gains so far through the course of the day today crossed all three of the classes of wheat. So, you know, obviously we had some moisture issues and some rain issues developing in Australia. That's got some quality concerns coming into that crop. You know, we're looking at the Southern Plains. Things are getting put into the ground, but now we got some areas that maybe the stand's not going to be there or germination's on uniform. You know, so that's got a little bit of concern also just talking global wheat supplies. You know, there's also just some talk, you know, China last year pumped uh, 40 million metric tons of wheat out of their reserves into feed usage. And then there's also just some whispers out there. They may be looking to get into the market here and possibly try to replenish those reserves. So wheat right now for importers, is that a bit of a tight spot, especially that of available wheat that's out there for them and we look at the daily tenders that come out and that's what you constantly see is you know 150,000 tons of wheat or 300,000 tons of wheat as countries are trying to find and lock in supplies here so so there's just some concern in this market that the importers are on are short bought right now and they're aggressively trying to buy this product because obviously they need those food or feed reserves you know built up again as we go forward into the next year well, and I know as well on, on top of that, uh, Russian troops on the Ukraine border, that's a, just another tailwind uh, in, in these wheat markets because obviously that's a, a big wheat growing area as well. So a little concern there too, John. Yeah, the geopolitical is always going to be out there. Again, that's another one of those things that does cause concern if it does something does arise out of that situation. You know, right now, just the price of wheat globally is on the climb. And the money flow is going into that commodity very, very strongly. You go look at where corn and beans are in terms of managed money positioning. You know, that Chicago wheat market is actually pretty thin, 15, 17,000 long contracts. So there's some room for money to move into that, you know, in comparison to where corn is or in comparison to where beans are in terms of total ownership of positions. Realistically, even though prices are where they are, the wheat market is probably a little bit short bought. John, as well, uh, soybean oil, good strength in edible oils, again, helping out uh, soybeans. And then, you know, corn kind of having to, we've talked about this, having to go along with soybeans just to maintain their acres, that fight for acres going into 22. And I feel like that that is going to be a storyline that uh, we're not going to see go away anytime soon. I feel like that's something, barring a a black swan event, we're going to be trading that storyline for the next couple of months ahead. I agree. You know, and that's something we got to keep on the radar. And really, corn's probably acting more as a follower than than the other, t- you know, from the other two grains so far. And how we we're trading on Monday, you know, just because that strength is there, up a handful of cents on the day, a little bit off the high. It just kind of feels like this market doesn't want to go any higher than where we are. We'll have to see if it can get some momentum. Again, that'll be see if it's driven out by that wheat market. But, you know, we're trying to get some wheat out of the feed bunks. That brings in some more corn demand in that regard. You're also trying to get these acres bought from the you know, wheat side. If prices are here, maybe we push a few more winter wheat acres in here at the, at the end. You know, does that pull away from corn? Then, obviously, you got the input costs and the breakdown, what happens there between corn and beans. You know, that ratio right now is still leaning a little bit more friendly to the corn side. We'll have to see if that continues to hold. The beans are trying to make this move a little bit higher here. 
yeah, it's going to be an interesting battle as we go forward. You know, what happens between all these grains? And it's not even counting the other major grains that are out there or other acreage out there between cotton and rice and, you know, other commodities, too, that are all going to be looking for some land to get to planted on this year so we can pr improve those food stocks globally. So that's a storyline that's not going to go anywhere. I think keep some good support underneath this market, barring some black swan events on the geopolitical side or just some turmoil in the markets that causes major selling pressure. You know, I think this core market is going to stay fairly well supported going into the new year. Weekly export inspections out today. We saw strength in these markets despite uh, the fact that we just continue to lag in weekly export inspections. I think I was looking at the numbers, 18%, uh, 27%, and 15% on corn, soybeans, and wheat, respectively. What do you make of where our uh, export situation sits right now and just uh, this week's uh, export numbers? Well, the three grains, obviously, soybeans still is the most concerning to me just because of the fact that we do have a competing product coming down the pipeline. And as we kind of close out the export window here, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. What's going to be the tail in terms of our shipment numbers? Typically, bean numbers explode very quickly till about the first part of the year and then start tailing back in terms of bushels getting moved. Now, that South American supply probably getting out a little bit earlier. That's going to tighten up that window even more so. That was one of the big differences last year. Year was those beans were planted late in South America and Brazil specifically. They harvested them late and it gave us another three, four weeks of window time to get more product shipped. So that's still the biggest concern is what's going on in terms of that crop. We'll obviously have to keep a close eye on the weather there. Corn's still at a decent pace. The big export window for that is when beans kind of die down and it kicks back in in the summertime. You know, in the late spring and the summers when the corn shipment numbers start really picking up. So at least at this stage, we're not too far behind the eight ball there. And I think it's something we can easily pick up, especially given some of the global demand that we're still seeing for the corn crop. So that's still, I'm a little more concerned again, like I said, about the bean side of the equation. Wheat is what it is. You know, we don't get a lot of wheat sold from time to time. The prices are extremely high. You know, the dollar is trading at basically the highest point now for almost for over a year. You know, so we're still kind of watching what's happening on those outside markets there. But again, just the global wheat price is lifting, and that's what's bringing wheat prices higher. John, crude oil uh, has dipped down to the $75 barrel mark. We're turning back around on Monday, trading a little bit higher. Also, the dollar trading a little bit higher. Yet, you know, both of those factors, um, we're, we're still seeing grains trade higher on Monday. Kind of kind of interesting to, to look at the dollar and crude oil trading higher. Um, wondering if maybe you know one trading better than the other helping out this grain market today. Well, again, a little bounce back in crude oil was kind of key. I mean, it's still obviously well off its highs, and charts don't look very good right now. And you got some talk that you know some United States as well as Japan today and China and other ones are mentioning about moving oil out of strategic reserves. So that's what put the pressure on the crude oil market. OPEC is possibly meeting about production quotas, so that kind of gave us some footing today. That's helping out that bean oil market, carrying back into the soybean market as well. So we'll have to continue to watch the headlines there in terms of oil. You know, it kind of looks like it's hit its course for at least a shorter term time window. It'll probably get some legs again, but at least right now it seems soft. So that's kind of impressive that, you know, we've had that pullback in crude and the grains have stayed strong. And then we've had that surge in the dollar and grains have stayed strong. So that tells me maybe that this is a little bit more of the inflation play as money's moving into the commodity sector, you know, protecting foodstuffs and protecting the value there, just making sure supplies are locked in, even despite that stronger U.S. dollar index. John, let's uh, let's flip the conversation over to livestock here today. And I was quite surprised that uh, with the higher grain prices, we saw feeder cattle higher today, live cattle uh, higher as well, and and the hog market kind of leading us to the top side. But really, uh, cattle is what got me by surprise there, just with the higher grain prices today. Uh, what are your thoughts in this cattle market as we start the holiday shortened week? Could be a couple things in play. Well, first off, cattle on feed Friday, really not too much yeah. of a miss in their numbers there. Like I said, we did see a little bit tighter supply of cattle overall. Still kind of curious to see where those heavier weight cattle came in at. You know, we saw production actually up last week and slaughter up last week. Still tells me there's a lot of cattle out there that could keep a little bit of a lid on the cash market. Cattle on feed, though, we got through the report. Nothing major that caused the market to want to go back down. So maybe we're just continuing to buy some strength. Watching the stock market today, I, you know, Today, President Biden renominated Powell for Fed chair. 
you know, that's probably still going to be supportive of an easier money flow. So that's seeing the stock market run today. And maybe that's spilling over into cattle because of consumer incomes a little bit higher. They got a little more money. Beef is a product that comes off of that. You know, so we'll have to see. Now, today, retail values firmer again, which was encouraging as well. We'll probably see cash trade tick higher one more time this week even though it's going to be a very short week and backed up because of some of the holiday slaughter paces slowing down, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. Now this is typically a window where cash can kind of peak out into the end of the year. You know, so maybe we're at a spot, you know, February at 139, April at 142, you know, we're starting to look at some good value. At least I might see some pullback, but obviously what's going to happen in the fundamentals will still be key. And I look at cash country this week. I know we're getting some early Southern asking prices, 136 or better. North not really defined yet. And, you know, with the holiday shortened week as well, I mean, one has to wonder, are we going to wait till Wednesday to really see some cash activity or is it going to is it going to pop up on us here um, either later this afternoon, Monday or most likely tomorrow? I think that's something that'll be interesting to watch as well. I agree. We'll probably see some trade more than likely coming together tomorrow. All depends on where the Packers are in terms of their bought condition. If they still got enough animal supplies put together, you know, they'll probably hold off till the end of the week or be just very light in terms of trade this week. So we'll have to see how that all shakes out. You know, obviously losing a day of kill on Thursday with the holiday, you know, definitely backs up some supplies, especially for cattle and both hogs. So again, how cash trade shakes out will be kind of key this week. You know, maybe we got one more good week of a bid just based on that strength in the carcass side of it. You know, making sure supplies are ready to go for next week. But again, typically the holiday trade is usually not very friendly to the cash market overall. What about the hog side? I, I, it feels like this market's probably going to be watching cash, watching where cutouts close today, and maybe looking at that uh, final slaughter total as well. Um, but uh, outside of those factors we're watching, still a pretty uh, decent start here to the week on Monday on the futures trade. Yeah, it is. Good to see a little bit of money flow coming, especially after how difficult things were on the close on Friday last week. Saw that December contract go back and retest those lows, or at least the trend line lows underneath this market. Good to see them hold and get a little bounce back today. Again, still there. It's going to come down to the fundamentals. They still keep lacking. We're not seeing that strength in retail values. We're not seeing that strength, especially in the cash market. Index down another dollar eighty today, kind of still reflecting what the general trend in cash is. So I'm a little cautious until we see that stabilize, you know, but we're getting to a window here that, you know, again, maybe we see that market start firming up. Hog numbers are expected to be softer so far. We're starting to see that on the weekly kills overall in terms of total production. So that might be enough to maybe get this market to turn around a little bit, but it's all going to start with that cash market. And until it finds some footing, it just feels like this market could still be on a slippery slope. John, how about that dairy market? Do you have an update for us there with what we're seeing as we start this new week? Well, we had a really good week in cash cheese trade over the last few days. That's what gave us a push back into those 19s and good value out there. Kind of fell apart pretty quickly on Friday, so I was a little disappointed. Maybe we just hit a point where there was good value and the sellers stepped in, especially for the weekend as well as the holiday week. You know, so keep keep an eye on cheese trade. We're still watching milk production. You know, right now it just feels like there's some pretty good demand out there. But again, for producers, you got good numbers out there. We're looking near $19 for all of next year on average right now. That's a heck of a spot to get started and make sure we got some milk hedged up or protected somehow going into 22. John, any final thoughts for us here today? You know, I, I think about this with the holiday week coming up, family's going to be getting together in some cases and, you know, maybe uh, you get some of those, uh, those farmers that have a different operation. Maybe they're talking with their brother or their, their uncle or something. And uh, maybe they get a little, uh, a little upset over the coffee table here and that their brother sold at this price. And they're wondering, you know, that kind of thing. I, who knows, you know, family, that kind of thing. I would have to think that if, uh, you know, if something like that would arise over the uh, Thanksgiving dinner table or whatnot, you got to keep your operation in perspective and not let something else or somebody else's comments uh, maybe, maybe get to you or just, you know, in general, if that situation doesn't come up over the dinner table, I just thought that was maybe a, a funny example to, to think about in regards to this idea. You know, again, that's obviously what you talk about is very true. You know, you can't worry about what your neighbors do. You worry about your own bottom line. And, you know, we got some great value in these grains. I put out on my morning broadcast this morning. It just, you know, A, make sure we keep some puts under things, especially if you're going to store it in the bin all the way out into the summer. B, if you got cash trade available in front of you, you know, we get these little pops like this. You move incrementally into it, continue to build your base. 
you know, if you want to keep ownership over top, you know, you can look at call strategies to do that. Not a real big fan, you know, in terms of reowning at 580 on corn because just where's that top going to be? But having something over top in case things go crazy, it doesn't hurt to have. But heck, you're still putting some pretty good numbers into the checkbook here. So that's going to be the biggest thing is producers stay disciplined. Ask yourself on a daily basis, is this good value? What's my risk? What do I need to protect uh, going forward? So, you know, again, the markets provide opportunities. And right now we may be in a window to definitely get some opportunities put in front of us. I'm looking at July beans at $13 today. You know, that was something a few weeks ago. I didn't know if we could get back to again. So we've had a heck of a rally, you know, kind of off of a not friendly USDA report overall uh, and with a big South America crop on the way. So there's starting to look like some pretty good value to me out there that you need to take advantage of and stay disciplined to your targets. Well, John, the producers need some advice. I know they could reach out to you and the team at Total Farm Marketing. Uh, what is the best way to do that? Sure, love chat with them anytime. Feel free to give me a call, 800-334-9779, or shoot me an email at johnh at totalfarmmarketing.com. Again, don't forget about that website, totalfarmmarketing.com. A lot of great information for producers that they can take a look of, look at, and then feel free to reach out through the website. Well, John, we appreciate the time. As always, great to uh, see you back safely in Wisconsin, and I will wish you and yours a happy Thanksgiving, and uh, we will talk to you again next week, sir. Thank you. Sounds great. Have a great Thanksgiving, everybody, and we'll see you next week. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing, our guest today here on Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. I'm your host, Jesse Allen, wishing you a great rest of your Monday.